Hi, welcome to my ECG video blog. I'm Ken Grauer, and I've just revised this first installment of my ECG video blog. The topic today is a case study involving possible AV block. But before getting into this case, please make note of this easy to remember link for my video review on the basics of AV block. It is www.avblockecg.com. For your convenience, I've also made a website that lists key links to my ECG blog, my video blogs, and my introductory and advanced books and EPUBs on ECG interpretation. Above all is my email address. Please write me with your comments, feedback, and questions. On to today's topic. Let's look at today's case, which was sent to me by Mike Fries, who does the Float Nurse ECG blog. Here's the rhythm, but there is no history. How would you interpret this rhythm strip? Additional questions to consider are the following. Is there AV block or something else? For example, sick sinus syndrome or non-conducted PACs. How can we tell if there is AV block? And if there is AV block, what type of AV block is present? These are the questions we are faced with. Before going further, what is missing from this tracing? The answer is that we simply don't know which leads are being monitored. It turns out that the leads being monitored on this simultaneously recorded two lead rhythm strip are lead three and lead V1. That said, why do we care what leads are being used? The answer is simply that we get lots of information from knowing the electrical viewpoint of our observations. This is because some leads are better than others for picking up P waves. Others are better for looking at the QRS. Ideally, we'll have more than a single monitoring lead because things occurring at the same instant in time will often look at least a little bit different from another electrical perspective. So in this case, we might ask if lead 3 and lead V1 are the best leads to use. Lead 3 isn't my favorite. It's an inferior lead, but in general not nearly as good as another inferior lead which is lead two, for picking up P waves. So my preference, if I only had one lead to choose from, would be to start with the lead two, since this is usually the best lead for picking up P waves. I'll emphasize usually, because lead two is not always the best lead for picking up P waves. For example, there are times, as for atrial flutter, when lead three may actually be better. When I'm able to get two leads, I like to add a right-sided lead, either lead V1 from a standard ECG or monitoring lead MCL1, which provides a similar view to what you see in lead V1. In general, lead V1 or MCL1 is the second best lead for picking up P waves after lead two. In addition, lead V1 or MCL1 provides the best view for assessing right-sided morphology, which is important when deciding whether the typical right bundle branch block pattern of aberrant conduction is or is not present. Finally, in the optimal situation of having access to three leads for monitoring, my preference is to add a left-sided lead such as V6 or MCL6. At this point, we might ask a more fundamental question, which is this. Is there atrial activity in the form of P waves? To answer this question, I always start with what I know. I know there is a P wave preceding the QRS complex that terminates the pause toward the end of this tracing, red arrow. It also looks like there is a P wave preceding the last beat on this tracing, as suggested by the blue arrow. So there is at least some atrial activity. That said, if all we had was a single monitoring lead, I would not be at all certain whether additional P waves are present. The amplitude of the deflections we see that might indicate atrial activity is just too small. 
so it's difficult to know if there is or is not atrial activity during the early part of this tracing. Fortunately, we have two simultaneously recorded leads, which are lead 3 and lead V1. Let's use them both. How then to use simultaneous leads for rhythm assessment? The key is to first determine what the normal ST-T wave looks like. To do this, we find the most normal beat we can, red arrow. Look at the ST segment of this most normal looking beat to see what a normal ST-T wave should look like. Note that this normal ST segment looks relatively flat within the red circle. Now carefully compare this normal ST segment to the other ST segments on the tracing. Is there a difference? Note, you are looking for small and often quite subtle differences in ST segment morphology that are not due to baseline movement or artifact. So look at the blue arrow. Compare the small but real negative notch that this blue arrow is pointing to with the normal ST segment within the red circle. Is there a difference? So the key is that we are looking for subtle but real differences in the ST segment that may indicate atrial activity, but which are not due to baseline wander or artifact. Determining whether any differences seen are real and not the result of artifact is not always an easy task. I suggest numbering the beats on any complex rhythm strip that you wish to discuss. This is easy to do, and it's really the only way to be sure we are all talking about the same thing. We said that beat number 10 is a normal beat, red arrow, and that the normal ST segment is flat within the red circle. In contrast, the ST segment of beat number 9 has a small negative notch blue arrow. Now look at the other ST segments in lead 3. The reason I think the small negative notch in the ST segment of beat number 9 in lead 3 is real is that the ST segments of beats number 1 through 8 in lead 3 all seem to vary, albeit slightly, in a way that suggests they are hiding atrial activity within the green circles. Now, make the same comparison in lead V1. The T wave of beat number 10 in lead V1 is again flat, but the ST segment of virtually all of the beats in this bottom tracing manifest a small negative notch with slight variation in the timing of this notch. We therefore suspect there are lots of P waves on this tracing. These, then, are the P waves. It makes perfect sense that these are the P waves, since the atrial rhythm is perfectly regular. Note that the P to P interval from one P wave to the next in this tracing is constant throughout. Hint, when there is time to do so, using calipers facilitates interpretation of any complex rhythm strip. There is no better or faster way to determine relationships between P waves and the QRS. There is also no better and faster way to determine if the rhythm is regular. Let's use calipers to carefully measure the P to P interval here. Note that the P to P interval is constant for all beats on this tracing. This confirms that the atrial rhythm is regular. One of the key points to remember about the ECG diagnosis of AV block is that the atrial rate should be regular, or at least fairly regular. There may be slight variation in the atrial rate due to underlying sinus arrhythmia or ventricular phasic sinus arrhythmia, but by and large with AV block, there will be a regular atrial rate. When there are pauses, but the atrial rate is not regular, then I think about things like PACs or blocked PACs and or sinus pauses or exit block, both of which are common with sick sinus syndrome. Let's put it all together and interpret this rhythm strip. As we do with any cardiac rhythm, 
Once we ensure that the patient is stable, we remember to watch our P's and Q's and the three R's. The five parameters to always assess in whatever sequence is most convenient for the rhythm at hand are the presence of P waves, QRS width, and the three R's, which are rate, regularity of the rhythm, and the relation, if there is one, of any P waves present to neighboring QRS complexes. The atrial rate in this rhythm is regular at about 70 per minute, red arrows. There is a brief pause in the ventricular rhythm between beats 9 to 10, and the QRS complex is narrow, clearly not more than half a large box in duration. Note that a P wave precedes each QRS complex on the tracing, albeit with a prolonged PR interval. One P wave is not conducted, green arrow. The PR interval prolongs before the drop beat. Note that this isn't obvious if we go from beat to beat because the difference in PR interval is small. But if you look at the PR interval just before the pause, prior to beat number nine, and compare it with the PR interval just after the pause, before beat number 10, it becomes obvious that the PR interval has lengthened until the drop beat occurs. After the drop beat, conduction resumes with a normal PR interval for beat number 10. Then we see the PR interval lengthen a little bit more before beat number 11 compared to the PR interval before beat number 10. In conclusion, this is not an easy tracing to interpret. We use the same P's, Q's, 3R approach as for any other rhythm. The atrial rhythm is regular, but a beat is dropped, green arrow. There is therefore some form of AV block. We know that the slight pause is not due to a blocked PAC or a sinus pause because the atrial rhythm is regular. One pearl from today is to be aware that with long wanky box cycles, you may not see any obvious difference in PR interval from one beat to the next. We therefore need to look at the PR interval right before the pause and right after the pause. Doing so makes it obvious that the PR interval is prolonging and that this rhythm is second degree AV block, Mobitz type 1, which is a synonym for AV wanky block. That's it for today. We hope you have enjoyed this case. Your feedback, comments, and questions are welcome. This is Ken Grauer saying goodbye for now.